All right, today what we'll do is we'll start with one more example where we think about name and Pearson lemma. Then I want to move on to doing some ideas in chapters 9 and 15 related to, well, testing a proportion in chapter 9, and then something called the chi-squared goodness of fit test for chapter 15. And I'm going to relate the example from chapter nine to the example from chapter 15. Next Tuesday, we'll continue talking a little bit more about chi squared goodness of fit test and we'll review for the exam. And uh, we'll see how that goes. So, the example I want to do next here, the last name and Pearson related example I want to do is kind of weird, very different than what you've ever done before, but maybe kind of interesting because of that. The null and the alternative hypotheses are going to be unlike what we've ever done before. Instead of testing parameter value, we're testing whether a random variable has one PDF versus a, di a different PDF. Or in this case, actually, one PMF, probability mass function, versus a different one because it's going to be a discrete random variable. Is the PMF of the random variable X equal to the PMF of a Poisson with a mean of one. So this is going to be e to the negative one times one to the X over X factorial, which since one to the X is one simplifies to just e to the negative one over x factorial when x is zero, one, two, three, et cetera, and zero otherwise, or the alternative hypothesis is that the PDF is going to be something else, PMF, I should say. Essentially, the PMF of what you might call a shifted geometric random variable. And when it's non-zero, it's going to be one half to the X plus one power for X equals zero, one, two, three, et cetera. I wanted to make it a shifted geometric random variable by effectively making this power x plus one instead of x, since I want the domain where this is non-zero to match the domain where this is non-zero, starting at x equals zero instead of x equals one. Zero otherwise. All right, we've never seen a hypothesis test like this before. Okay, and I rarely think about such things. I, I was reading in this book again and found it as, a, as an example and saw that I had highlighted it, so I had studied it before. Uh, so it's evidently something I've looked at before, but I didn't remember it. Okay. So we want to think about doing this hypothesis test. How? Well, for a given alpha, the goal would be to try to find a critical region. Or maybe we decide on a critical region and figure out alpha. In fact, we're going to do the second thing because that's easier. We're going to decide on a critical region and find alpha, the probability of a type one error the level of significance of the test. What would the critical region be here? These, the possible values of X are discrete, zero, one, two, three, et cetera. But this is clearly, it's hard to say whether this is a right-tailed test or a left-tailed test or something else. I don't know what to call it, right? It's unlike anything we've ever done before. How do you decide what values of X would lead to rejecting this null hypothesis in favor of the alternative? And if you did, reject the null incorrectly, what's the probability of making a type one error? Thinking about the name and Pearson lemma is helpful. Because it turns out the proof of the name and theorem Pearson lemma actually allows us to generalize it. Now we didn't look at the proof, but that's what these authors said. If you study the proof of it in depth enough, you realize you can generalize the proof to a more general setting, including this kind of setting. And the likelihood ratio still defines the best critical region, which 
maybe this would be a multiple choice question for the for the exam. What does it mean to be a best critical region? It means the most powerful critical region for a given alpha, it's going to maximize the power, minimize the probability of a type two error. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the likelihood ratio. I think I will not use the L notation because there's really not, in a sense, one likelihood function because there are two different PMFs. But I will write the ratio, that's the product of the likelihood functions for each of these things individually. The numerator for the null hypothesis, the denominator for the alternative hypothesis. So we, in the numerator, we do have the product of these kinds of expressions, e to the negative one over x sub i factorial. And in the denominator, we have the product of these kinds of expressions, one half to the x sub i plus one. So this would still be the likelihood ratio. And we could still say this being less than or equal to some number would be what we would use to define a best critical region that makes the test most powerful, maximizes the power. It's going to be less than or equal to K. What is K? It depends on what alpha is. K and alpha are related. But that kind of inequality is what defines the best critical region, according to the Neyman Pearson lemma in a more general form. Of course, you usually want to simplify this. E to the negative one is getting multiplied by itself n times, so that's the same as e to the negative n. In the bottom, we really have like an x1 factorial times an x2 factorial times an x3 factorial. That doesn't convert to a sum. It would still be a product. I could put the product in the bottom of the fraction, though. Is this a good idea or not? I guess it's not clear. Of course, this is the same as one half to the first power times one half to the xi. <clears throat> you could bring the one half to the first power out in front as one half to the nth power because you'd be multiplying it by itself n times. And that's the same as two to the negative n. Might be a nicer way to write that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the other one halves, you could add their exponents. You could do this kind of thing. Convert the product to a sum of the exponents. Can we continue simplifying? Sure. You got e to the negative n over two to the negative n. That could be written as e over two to the negative n want, or even 2 over e to the positive n. And actually, because this is a 1 half to the summation power, you could bring it into the numerator as a 2 to the summation power. Does that make sense? because one half is two to the negative one. It's in the bottom, it could go into the top as a two. And then the product of the xi, oh, I, I made a mistake, xi factorials. I forgot my factorial there. Goes down there. Okay, it's a little better looking, I guess. <clears throat> so best critical region, is defined by that kind of inequality. And in theory, you could imagine it to be <clears throat> a set of points in n-dimensional space satisfying this inequality. But of course, that's a very complicated looking inequality still. It's hard to imagine what that set would look like, so to speak, even if n were one or, well, even if n were two or three. I mean, you could try to use Mathematica to graph it perhaps. 
for different values of k and n. And maybe, maybe I'll do that on Monday. We'll see if we can get Mathematica to graph it when n is two or three, just to see what it looks like, what the best critical region looks like as a subset of two or three dimensional space. I mean, more often we try to write this in terms of summations so we can use statistics to decide to reject or not. And this could be thought of as a statistic, but it's it's a very complicated statistic. I could take logarithms. That would certainly be one way to try to um, rewrite this in a way that that might be a lot simpler. Um, I think I'm not going to bother. Instead, let's see how this simplifies if we plug in. special value of n and k. Plug in n equals one, sample of size one, and k equals one, just to keep things simple. What does it look like? What does the inequality become? If you do that, it, it becomes a lot simpler, actually. You get two over e to the first power, times two to the, if n is one, you really just have an x one up top and an x one factorial on the bottom. And if little k is one, then if I have a one there, and this could be rewritten as two to the x one over x one factorial is less than or equal to e over two. And what is e over two? It's about 1.359. So in that case, when I've got a sample of size one, would you ever want to do samples of size one? Uh, that would be rare. Maybe if it's unavoidable, you could. If you had to just do a sample of size one to make a decision here, Probably not a good idea unless you just can't avoid it, but this would lead to a decision rule. It, it's possible the alpha could be large, though, that the probability of type 1 error could be large. And in fact, that will happen. It's going to be kind of large. But we'll figure it out anyway. I pick k to be 1. Rarely would k be 1. You'd usually want little k to be something less than 1. But just, to just for the purposes of illustration is all this is. So the critical region would be defined by this inequality. And the question is now is what is alpha? What's the probability of type one error? So that's the probability of rejecting the null when the null is true. In other words, it's the probability for this n equals one and this k equals one that, yeah, you could say the random variable two, o, two to the x over x factorial. Notice I'm not putting a subscript of one there because it's just one observation, so I don't need to is less than or equal to 1.359 given that the null is true, meaning remember what the null is, it's a hypothesis about the form of the PMF. I'll say given that X is Poisson because that is a Poisson. with a mean of one. The null hypothesis formula was the PMF for a Poisson with a mean equal to one. Remember Poisson and geometric random variables both count things. Geometric random variables as we usually think about them count the number of trials till the first success.
actually this shifted geometric random variable, which includes a value x equals zero, would count the number of failures until the first success. And if your success is on the first trial, that means your number of failures was zero. There's really two ways to think about geometric random variables, either the number of trials until the first success or the number of failures until the first success. If you count the number of trials and trials and trials until the first success, X can't be zero. The minimum value of X is one. But if you count the number of failures until the first success, if your first success is on the first trial, then you had zero failures. That's Poisson. Poisson counts the number of occurrences of an event, sometimes, oftentimes in a given time interval, for example. During the next hour, how many cars will go through the, in through the intersection? How many people will show up in the store in the next hour or the next day? Those are examples of Poisson random variable applications. How are we going to figure this out? I guess we'd have to figure out what values of X would lead to this inequality being true. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. Are we, which, which of those lead to this kind of inequality being true? X factorial does grow faster than two to the X does. So when X is large enough, this inequality should be true. So it's going to initially seem like it could be a right tailed test. But is it? Today's class 17. Uh, let's make a table of values, say x comma 2 to the x over x factorial. We'll do approximations there. As x goes starting at 0 and goes up to, say, 10. Yeah, when X is large enough, we get pretty small numbers. Certainly the inequality is satisfied, but the inequality is actually also satisfied when X is zero. It's only not satisfied when X is one or two. So, this probability is the same as the probability of X equaling zero, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, given X is Poisson with mean of one. Not one or two. Simplest way to compute that probably would be use, use the complement rule. Like that. Oh, and for variety, let's use the calculator. Go to your distributions menu. Poisson PDF, lambda is the mean. When x is one, what's the probability of the PDF? It's 0.368 approximately. And when x is two, About 0.184. 
So we get 0. 0.448. If we use this as a rejection region, right here, the critical region, we call it C. C as a set here, the critical region would be the set containing zero, three, four, five, six, et cetera, not, not one or two. That will be a best critical region for this value of alpha. Now, it's hard, because of the discrete nature of this random variable, it's hard to imagine that there's some other critical region corresponding to this exact value of alpha or even this approximate value of alpha. But this will be a best one. It will maximize the power. Now, again, that's, that's a large value of alpha. You'd never want to use that. So it's just the purposes of illustration. And this value of alpha does correspond to the little k here equaling one in this case. More typically, little k would be smaller, and that would lead to an alpha that's smaller. But I wanted to use the k equals little k equals one because it resulted in a strange looking critical region, just to illustrate that strange looking critical regions can happen. That was the point, actually. Unexpected, that's an unex unexpected result. If k gets smaller and alpha gets smaller, then the critical region becomes more ordinary looking. Uh, if if we had well, a smaller number here, like half of that, 0.6 something say, then your critical region is all X values bigger than or equal to something, a more ordinary looking critical region. So the point here is just educational, instructive, that it is possible for weird looking critical regions to happen. What's the power of this test? And as always, what's the probability of a type two error? They're related. You know, the power is one minus beta, where beta is the probability of a type two error. Let's just compute it as the power. What's the power of the test? That would be maximized for this given alpha for this test. It would be the probability that uh, you are in the critical region, given that the alternative is true. X is zero, three, four, five, six, seven. Given that H1 is true, H1 is true, which means X, the random variable, has a quote unquote shifted geometric ge distribution. This is my name, by the way, shifted geometric. I don't know that that's the official name. It's PMF is that thing. So that's the thing we have to use com to compute probabilities for the power. And once again, we should use the complement rule. And let's once again have Mathematica do it for us. Well, I guess we did it with calculator before, didn't we? Oh, that's, that's this is easy enough to do with calculator, and we don't even need to use the distribution menu. PMF is one half raised to the x plus one power. When X is one, that's one half squared, one fourth. When X is two, that's one half to the third power, one eighth. Oh, running out of room, one eighth. One fourth plus one eighth, what is that? Three eighths, one minus three eighths is five eighths. The power is five eighths point six two five, and for this for this alpha of point four four eight, that's the biggest the power can be. That's what the name and Pearson lemma guarantees.
Okay. So it's no pun intended, or maybe I should say pun intended. This is a pretty powerful thing, really. It's very flexible. It's it applies to lots of situations, including weird situations. Maybe that's something to remember for on the job for the future is hey, I remember Naaman Pearson applied to weird situations. Maybe I should try that because I don't know what else, what else to do with this situation that I'm trying to make a decision about some model. Poisson distributions, by the way, are used all the way all the time, for example, in insurance. Counting the number of earthquakes in the next five years, for example, or whatever, the number of fires in this town in the next five years. Simplest thing to do is model it as, as a Poisson, but maybe somebody's trying to argue that something like this is more appropriate. So it could happen on the job. But in general, you'd want a sample of size bigger than one, so you'd need to deal with a more complicated thing. So you, you could deal with this on a more um, a less abstract level. You could just might say focus on it more computationally. Seeing when that kind of inequality holds for a given alpha. All right, let's move on now to the uh, second thing to do today that is going to be related to the third thing to do today chapter 9 and chapter 15 the beginning of chapter 9 focuses on um, confidence interval for a population proportion I'm, okay it's one of those things where again I you should be able to do it okay I'll go ahead and write it down CI to estimate population proportion P based on a given confidence level, 100 times one minus alpha percent. Is P hat? plus or minus z sub alpha over two times square root of p hat times one minus p hat over the sample size, where p hat is called the sample proportion. It is x over n. n is the sample size. x is the number of successes that you actually observed. Right, you've done that before. For example, OK, I'm going to talk about my free throw shooting again. I claim my, I'm a 40% free throw shooter. Terrible. Yes, I know. Of course, I, I, in all likelihood, I'm wrong, right? That's a population parameter. To say it's exactly 40%, not likely. Maybe I'm 39.9643295788% free throw shooter in reality. Of course, maybe that's kind of a nonsense statement. To begin with, we're trying to keep things simple, though, so we don't try to get too philosophical about it. I can use this kind of formula to estimate my true proportion of free throws that I make on average over the long run. So I could, I could try 100 free throws. Maybe I make 38 of them. P hat is 38 out of 100, 0.38. I'm after a 95% confidence interval. Z sub 0 0.025 is going to be our old friend, 1.96. So I get 0.38 plus or minus 1.96 square root of 0.38 times 0.62 divided by 100. Margin of error looks to be about 0 0.095. So this is about 0.38 plus or minus 0 0.095 in interval notation. That'll be 
and what? 285 to 0.475. Using closed interval notation like our book does, but open interval notation is fine. The, the endpoints don't ma matter so much. Whether you think of them as being in the interval or not, we're approximating things anyway. It's not a big deal. So based on that random sample of size 100, I'm 95% confident that my true proportion the true proportion that describes my true free throw percentage in the absence of any game pressure situation in my driveway is in this interval somewhere. A wider interval than I expected actually, but that's what it is if I haven't made a mistake. You can also do hypothesis testing. Hmm. Maybe somebody else comes to me and says, says, Kenny, I don't think you're a 40% free throw shooter. I think you're a 30% free throw shooter. I could do a hypothesis test to disprove their claim. Disprove in quotes. It's not really disproving, right? Nothing's ever certain here. Now let's go ahead and make the alternative as we usually do a composite alternative, not a simple one like we've been doing recently. He is greater than 0.3 because I think my true percentage is bigger than 0.3. I secretly think it's 0.4. I could make this simple and make it P equals 0.4. And maybe we will go ahead and figure out the power of the test when P is 0.4. But in practice, what people typically do is a right-tailed test or a left-tailed test or a two-tailed test. I haven't talked about p-values in this class. We could find the p-value of the test, and I think I will, but let's do it with rejection region, for, rejection region first. Let's say we want to set the level of significance to be 0 0.01. Oh, let's make it 0 0.05. It is a right-tailed test, so I don't find Z sub alpha over two like I did with the confidence interval. So this is different. I find Z sub alpha itself because it's a right-tailed test. I want the area to the right of the critical value to be 5%. That's not gonna be 1.96, it's gonna be 1.645, I believe. I think I've used that enough to memorize that, but let's just double check. In norm area 0.95. Yeah, 1.645. So the, the critical region, and it would be a best critical region, a most powerful critical region, it turns out, though I won't prove that with the name in Pearson Lemma would be Z values greater than or equal to 1.645. So we need to compute our test statistic and the, that is gonna be a Z test statistic and see if it's bigger than 1.645 or not. What is the Z statistic in this situation? It turns out to be P hat, the observed sample proportion, minus the null value, P sub zero, we're standardizing here, divided by this, what's an approximation for the, um, well, what would be the actual standard deviation of the sampling distribution of P hat if the null is true? Turns out to be square root of P zero times one minus P zero over N. You can look at the book's derivation of that in chapter nine if you like. It is related to the central limit theorem. Actually, this is an approximation because we are using the central limit theorem. And let's go ahead and use the 0.38 that I pretended that I had from the confidence interval again, and just see what happens here. 0.38 minus 0.3 divided by square root of 0.3 times 0.7 over 100.
divide by 0 0.0021. We're going to get a pretty big value of z here. We're going to reject the null. Whoops. Did I make a mistake? Oh, I forgot. I, I forgot to take the square root. Sorry. The square root in there. Okay, it's not quite as big. Is it big enough to reject the null? 1.746. Yes, it's greater than or equal to 1.645. Therefore, reject the null at the alpha equals 5% level of significance. Just double check my calculations. Oops. Okay, looks good. What's the power of the test and the probability of type one error? Type two error, excuse me. By the way, I could have figured out the probability of the type two error here. It would have been one minus 0.625.375. As always. <clears throat> Careful with the with the power in this situation. What do you choose for the alternative value? It's a right tailed test. You have freedom. There are different powers depending on which different right tailed value you use. How do you decide? <clears throat> For a right-tailed test, you, you try to decide on the minimum value of P whose truth you'd like to have high power to detect. What's the smallest value of P in the alternative hypothesis here? Is it 0 0.32, 0 0.34, 0 0.37, 0 0.4? What's the smallest value of P that you'd like to be able to detect with high power? It's not a life or death situation here. I'm just shooting free throws. Maybe I say, I really want to be able, be able to detect, be able to reject the, the null here correctly with high power if um, I'm a 32% shooter. What's the power when P is 32%. It's not going to be as high as the power if P were something bigger. Right? If P were bigger, like 0.4, for example, I have a much better chance of correctly rejecting the null if the true value P is 0.4. So this power, because I've chosen a value not much bigger than 0.3, might be a fairly small power. Let's just see what it is. Power, probability of rejecting the null when the alternative is true, probability that uh, ultimately we get a Z value bigger than 1.645. When the alternative is true, okay, we should figure out Yeah, this is going to be a small power. Um, I really need to do something else before I can cal calculate. I need to figure out what the rejection region is in terms of p hat. Did that happen? What's the rejection region in terms of p hat? In terms of z, it's greater than or equal to 1.645. Z is p hat minus 0.3, the null value, divided by the square root of 0 0.0021. 
being greater than or equal to 1.645. solve that inequality for p hat. So square root of 0 0.0021 is about that. Multiply that by 1.645, then add 0 0.3 to it. This equivalent to p hat being greater than or equal to 0.375, four say. That's the rejection region in terms of p hat. So therefore to figure out the power, I have to figure out the probability that p hat is greater than or equal to that if I assume P is 0.32 instead of 0.3. Yeah, this is gonna be a small power. To get a power bigger than 0.5 even, I'd have to make P bigger than 0.3754. So this is gonna be a very small power, but let's go ahead and figure it out anyway. Standardize, subtract not 0.3, but 0.32 now. Divide by a slightly different number, 0.32 times 0.68 over 100, and then take the square root. I guess I'm not gonna take the time to figure out the p-value because we need to move on to something else. 0.32 times 0.68 divided by 100 is this, take its square root, and then take 0.37, 54 minus 0.32 divided by that. Use a normal CDF. Get 0 0.1170, an unacceptably small power. How do you fix it? Well, easiest fix is to pick up different value of P, bigger. Uh, but if you really wanna be able to detect with high power that this is true, reject the null when this is true, the only alternative is just to increase the sample size. Though increasing the sample size will change what the rejection region is in terms of p hat, and well, that's, that's a good thing actually, but the best alternative is to increase the sample size. <clears throat> With the remaining time, I wanna look at this exact same kind of problem, but in, from a different perspective. It's a more complicated perspective actually, and maybe we only have time to just get started on it. Um, Instead of just trying to do a test on my proportion of free throws, let me do a test on whether my, when I shoot free throws, do I really follow a binomial distribution? Is my number of successes in n trials really following a binomial distribution, which effectively means are my trials independent with their constant probability of success? Binomial counts the number of successes in n trials, right? It's one of our favorite distributions. And so let me do imagine instead of doing 100 free throws and just counting the number of successes, let me do a 100 experiments. Actually, make, let me make it 200 experiments of five free throws each, five three throws at a time, three throws at a time. <clears throat> so in other words, I'm doing a thousand free throws total. And I'm not just counting the number of successes. Instead, within each group of five free throws, I'm counting the number of successes in that group of fired free throws. And I'm keeping track of those numbers. Sometimes I'll have zero successes, sometimes I'll have one. Most likely I'll have maybe two successes, sometimes three, sometimes four, and maybe very, very rarely I'll make five out of five. It's 
So I'm going to have a bunch of zeros, ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives. And what I'd like to test is whether or not the proportion of those numbers, zeros, ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives, matches the expected proportions I'd get if my if my distribution of how I shoot free throws really is binomial. To figure that out, I really need to think about a binomial distribution with n equals five. And let's go back to p being 0.4 instead of 0.3, which I think is true, closer to my true probability of success. What's a binomial distribution with n equal to five and p equal to 0.4 look like? Well, let's just make, of course, it's got the formula for the PMF would be f of x equals five choose x times 0.4 to the x times 0.6 to the five minus x, that would be the PMF. Let's just use the calculator to find values of the PMF for the possible values of x where it's non-zero, which would be zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Binome PDF, five trials, 0.4 probability of success. First X value is zero. What's its probability? 0 0.07776. Binome PDF, five trials. Okay, increase X to one now. Probability becomes 0.2592. If my probability of success truly is 0.4, I would expect the probability of x equaling 2 to be the largest, or 2 to be the mode. And 2 would also be my expected value, my mean as well. n times p is 5 times 0.4 is 2. Yep, that's going to be the largest one, 0.3456. Oops, wrong thing. What in the world happened there? I, I thought it. I thought I picked binome PDF. There we go. Now the values start getting smaller. And my probability of making five out of five is very small because I'm not very good. About a 1% chance on a given set of five attempts that I make all five. Hmm. What I want to do is I want to imagine these numbers, these six numbers to effectively be like six proportions that I'm testing. P1, or maybe I should call it P0 since it's zero successes. P1, uh, let me go back to calling it P1. P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, and P6. I want my null hypothesis effectively to be those equalities there. That's what I'm testing. And my alternative hypothesis, what is it? Um, it's that at least one of those P's is not equal to what you see. Effectively, just the negation of the known. At least one P sub i is not as specified. Over there. So what I'm really testing, since these P's came from a binomial distribution, I'm really testing whether my free throws are following a binomial distribution or not. 
with these with ultimately with k equal to 0.4 but yes it really is focused on whether it's binomial or not i guess you should say with also n equal to 5 and equal to 0.4 when i do five attempts so how do you do this test you use a new statistic that we've well, the statistic itself takes a form we've never seen before, though it does have a distribution we've seen before. A statistic that ends up having a chi-squared distribution. This is called a chi-squared test, particularly a chi-squared goodness of fit test, because we're sort of seeing how well the data fits a distribution. How good is it? The fitting, goodness of fit. The test statistic, It's typically written like that. That's not an X, that's a chi, capital chi. Maybe, maybe we'll do that like this to emphasize that. It's not standard. Chi square. And it turns out to equal, once you've got data, well, okay, there's two ways that it's written in the book. Summation, I goes from one to, um, Typically, the uh, different values of the different possible categories for X, the number of them is K, written K, not N. And that's a good thing to label it something other than N, because in this example, at least N is five. It's XI minus n times pi squared divided by n times pi. I have to explain this. That's also written in this way. Xi is sometimes written as oi. And to emphasize it's an o and not a zero, I'll make it look cursive with a little curly thing up there. Oi. O stands for observed minus capital EI, which stands not for error, but for expected. N times PI is really an expected value squared divided by EI. And the reason we do it this way is because it's just a little easier to remember. Observed minus expected squared divided by expected. The observed values come from the data that you get when you actually do the experiment. The expected value comes from the null hypothesis. These different PIs get multiplied by the sample size. Yes, that's five. Each experiment, experiment is five attempts. They get multiplied by the PIs to find the expected number of successes. This expected number of zeros, expected number of ones, expected number of twos, threes, fours, and fives. Can organize your work in a table here. Effectively, we can continue this table further to the right. I'll rewrite it here. But now I'll use subscripts. You've got the xi values. Zero, one, two, three, four, and five. You got the, the pi values. N is five. Worth mentioning as well, those PI values are 0 0.07776, 0 0.2592, 0 0.3456, 0 0.2304, 0 0.0768, 0 0.01024. You might say those are too many significant digits, and that would be certainly a valid thing to argue, but it really doesn't make a big deal as far as doing the test or not. You got the EI values. N times PI, zero times that is zero, one times that is, um, well, excuse me, I gotta multiply by five. I'm doing this wrong. Okay, the, I'm mixing up my ends. N is not five, it's 200. 
200 experiments of five preachers at a time. Yeah, there's an end there. But when doing this test, I'm kind of ignoring that end. The end to the test needs to be the number of experiments that you're doing. And it's 200. So I, I got to multiply these not by the X size this I was initially doing, but by 200, in fact. So I don't get zero there. I get 200 times 0 0.07776. And let's just go ahead and round 15.6a. It's not going to make a big difference. Then 200 times the next PI, 51.8. Two hundred times the next one, sixty-nine point one. Two hundred times the next one, forty-six point one. Two hundred times the next one is about fifteen point four. And finally, two hundred times the last one is close to two. 2.0 say. What do these numbers represent? They represent when I do this thing, a thousand free throws total, 200 experiments of five free throws at a time. And each time I attempt five, I count the number of successes. In 200 such experiments, I should expect about 15 or 16 of them to have zero successes about 52 or so of them to have one success, about 69 or so to have two successes, 46 or so to have three, 15.4, 15 or 16 to have four, and only about two of them to have perfect five out of five. What do I actually observe? Well, that depends. What did I actually observe? They don't have to be super close to these numbers. Maybe this one I get 12, this one I get 52, this one I get 73, this one I get 41. These numbers do have to add to 200, so I can't pick them completely arbitrarily. 13, how far are we so far? 12 plus 52 plus 73 plus 41 plus 13. Oh, I, I should make one of these too big. I, I'm not gonna have nine, five out of fives. Okay, let's make this uh, 17 instead. Then I'm going to have five ones where there were five out of five that I made. Now you've got these numbers, you can plug it in the formula. Can calculate the observed minus expected squared divided by the expected. Oh, let's see. So we got. Uh, 12 minus 15.6 divided by, and I got to square that, divide by 15.6, 1 say, 52 minus 51.8 squared divided by 51.8, very small, 0. 0.0007. Running out of time. Not going to quite finish this. Let me just tell you what you would do from here. You would add these things up, right? Because you see a summation sign there. Get something. What you've gotten is the observed value of this chi square statistic. Wait a minute. Chi square statistics have degrees of freedom. How many degrees of freedom are there here? With K minus one degrees of freedom. The number of categories minus one. How many categories are there here? There's one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Zero through five is six categories. K minus one is therefore five. So you get a chi squared with five degrees of freedom. You are, 
effectively just seeing whether that's going to be based on a given alpha, whether it's bigger than a given number in the table. Quick look at the table. If it is, then you reject the null. If it's not, then you don't reject the null. Chi square distribution with five degrees of freedom. If you get, for example, say 10, that means the left tail probability is between 0.9 and 0.95. But to decide to reject the null or not, we want the right tail probability. We need to subtract these numbers from one. The right tail probability, which is going to be effectively the p value, is going to be between 1 minus 0.9 and 1 minus 0.95, between 5 and 10%. And yes, based on a given alpha like 0 0.05, you could say this is the critical value, 11.1. .1, so you'd reject if the observed value is bigger than that and fail to reject if it's not. Quick 10 seconds of philosophy. You might say in all likelihood, there's no way the null is true, right? All those numbers, exactly. But remember the philosophy is you're giving the null the benefit of the doubt until proved otherwise. That's the philosophy. Have a good day.